On the F-89, North Van ended up getting a contract to build a, a fighter. And the F-89 was a bit unusual in that it was a lot faster than the airplane that North had been, been developed in, had to develop before, so we knew that it could no longer be flown manually. It had to be powered by hydraulic power systems. As a result, we got into a lot more research in the development of hydraulic systems, particularly the valves to control the actuators. And the old 1600 and 1400 PSI systems, the valves would work fine, but at 3000 PSI, they would lock up and you couldn't move them. And as a result of working with a group of people from a small company called Bertea, we ended up developing a hydraulic valve that was very easy to move and a very precise, which we thought was ahead of the industry. I can't prove it, I don't, but it seemed that we thought it was ahead of the industry. Anyway, we developed a 3000 PSI for the F-89. And as a result, in order to really do a good test system on it, we built what was, ended up becoming called an Iron Bird, which was a big, heavy steel structure in which we mounted all the flight controls, powered flight control systems in our exact location route to each other as in the airplane. So we could actually test all the systems then and not have to fool around utilizing the airplane. And so we can make changes as necessary. The F-89, when it was first designed and the first few that flew, was very light, very low wing loading, and it could climb very high altitude. I don't remember what it was, but it climbed very high altitude. As the design progressed on the thing, the Air Force kept wanting more and more armament on it until we ended up with Start, we ended up with 600 gallon fuel tanks in each wingtip, and then they wanted to put more armament on it instead of that. So we ended up with a tank that carried this, I forget, I think it was, I don't forget how many hundred gallons of fuel in it, but it also carried uh, 52 rock, two and three quarter inch rockets. And eventually that got modified to where he put in three huge GAR missiles infrared sensors. Each of these missiles was housed inside the, the pod and when the pilot oh, turned on a switch to uh, launch the missile, the doors flew open and a launcher came up with a missile. But the system was not designed properly so every time the missile started up the doors bounced back and grabbed the missile and wouldn't let it come out. So about that time I have to be walking by a room in which they're showing sl sl slow motion or yeah, slow motion films of the doors operating in the operation of the, of the launcher. And uh, they had been doing lots of flight tests and doing lots of tests and, and concepts to cut down the bouncing back of the door. And, I just made an offhand comment as I went by to the fellow next to me that any stupid fool will know that that's the wrong approach. They're trying to fix something which they got to look at the source of the problem, not try to fix it, find out what's causing it. So, and as I walked on down, we walked on down past the door, one of the engineers came out and asked who said that, and I told him I did, and he was a head of engineering at the time. And he said, you know how to fix it? I said, absolutely. All you got to do is reverse the mechanism for the opening of the doors. So I said, you got the job. Fix it. And I told him, turn it over to the guys. I'll tell them what to do. Let the guys design it do it. It's not right to just take it away from them. He said, you got the job. So we had it. Had a, I was told then to, you know, I can't remember if they had any help or not. I might have had one or two other engineers to redesign the whole system. And uh, you know, I guess the hydraulics people got it too because we wanted to put some restrictors in the line. And as a result, as we were working on it then, I don't remember what the level was, one of the 
other upper level above the chief engineer told me I had to work 500 times. And I told him, well, why does it have to work 500 times? It's never worked before. And so I said, it's better work 500 times. So we actually built a test model and operated and operated 500 times before we shut it off. And I don't know whether they've gone much more than that or not, because we hadn't put in really the type of bearings we wanted here and there, but it's in order for, for speed to get it done while we ran the test. So as a result then, the contract was safe, because the Air Force had told the Northrop that if they didn't fix the problem, they are going to cancel the contract. So I was really happy about that thing, that it worked. And also later on in the F-89 system, I noticed that the fuel system design was so complex that I didn't think anybody could really analyze it unless they really, really studied it. And they had a console that had lighted panel on which showed where all the components were and the only pilot had to do was push various buttons. So if this failed, this system would take over, etc. But if he didn't do it right, he could wipe out the system. So I got the job of redesigning the fuel system and making it very simple. And at that time I realized you had to do a, a true failure analysis for every system in order to make sure that you had the fewest number of parts in the most reliable system. From then on, any system we designed, we ra always ran a failure analysis on the system, which I don't know is new or not, but um, it sure helped us in design. So later on, then, as the airplane was doing their flight test programs, we found out that the wings were falling off. And it'd be one wing or the other, never consistent which wing. And <clears throat> I ended up being assigned as a North representative along with Lou Nelson, a flight test pilot, as representative from Northrop for all crash investigations of the airplane. And it's very interesting and it's very difficult to figure out why. We finally figured out the reason that the wings had to be coming off, or at least we thought we did, because the wing was attached by a big forging in which bolts were attached to the, both the wing and the fuselage. And, uh, and we found that that forging was cracking. And it cracked, it seemed to crack like wood. It had a definite grain in it, which you could see then it caused by stress corrosion. And Alcoa, who had designed and made the forgings, had done lots of tests, and we had, Northrop had done lots of tests, and we hadn't come across this phenomenon. But as a result, we changed the forgings, and I, I don't remember what all we did with the forging, but anyway, we also found one of the causes of the, of the cracks was that the holes in which the bolts were put through to attach to the fuselage had little scratches in them. And evidently from those little scratches, crack propagation had started. So we ended up then reaming out those <coughs> all, all the new holes and polishing them so that we didn't have any scratches in them. And from there on, we never had a problem with wings coming off. We modified several hundred airplanes at Northrop, replacing all those wings. One of the design jobs I had on the F-89 was design of the flap system. And on the flaps we had a rolling type flap that, I forget what it's called, or extended out to give us a much more area for the wing. And it was designed by, operated by a rotary hydraulic motor that would rotate a, a long drive shaft that had universal joints and to, to a screw joint and would push the flaps out. Uh, during the flight test program, I got um, sort of friendly with one of the Air Force test pilots named Captain LaRoche. And I was told him one of the most interesting flight thing sequences I thought was most fun was to do a slow roll after takeoff, which my instructor had showed me how to, which I never did, but he showed me how to do it during my flight training. So he thought he would never try a thing like that. And one time, I think it was at Tyndall, he was on a demonstration flight for the F-89, and he's coming in for the approach, the airplane started to roll. 
and he just kept on rolling and rolled the thing completely over, and as he rolled out flat horizontal, the wheels touched the ground. And when he taxied up, then he said, "How'd you like that? Have you ever tried doing a slow roll on landing?" <laughs> and it was really, really entertaining. And uh, we looked into it, and we found out then that there had been sab sabotage in Northrop. Is that some somebody had used a false or had taken somebody's inspection stamp and modified it in some little way, which we detected, and. What he had done, he had taken out the screws that uh, were used to tie the universal joints to the rotating, rotor, rotating shaft. So that way then, if you took them out, why then that flap wouldn't go down. So the flap on the other side went down, but the one that he had sabotaged wouldn't. And it's almost sure to kill somebody. And little roach just happened to be smart enough to complete the roll instead of trying to recover from it. <clears throat> So it was a big investigation, but they never found it. FBI was all over the place, but they never did find out who did it. One of the other interesting aspects of the F-89 was a flight test program in which pilot test pilots would go out and fire the rockets to see what they could hit. And at this particular flight, they had hit their targets quite well, so they wanted to come back <coughs> ask for permission to fly over the field and do a victory roll. They did a, a roll, and they, I don't remember how many other rolls they made, but then they started getting erratic, and they ended up then plowing into the ground. <clears throat> In the accident investigation, we f found out that uh, <clears throat> we found out that the flight control stick, you know, the stick under the stick boot. Every time you took the stick boot out, you're supposed to take the stick out and make sure there's no debris in there. Because, uh, and uh, evidently on this cr crash, somebody had dropped a bowl or, or a screw or, I forget all, we found a fair amount of debris in a stick socket. And evidently what had happened that the, a bowl had gone around and it actually caught the stick to where it wouldn't go in one way. But if you push it exactly opposite, opposite way, it would have cleared. But the pilot was fighting it, and then he went in with it. So after that, then there was much more attention paid in flight tests of really making sure that boot was clean when they did any anything in the cockpit. They were always taking that boot out because of access to other stuff around it. 